Today, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Joaquin Neto is Vice President of Healthcare at Verado. He has decades of experience in information management and master data management technologies across industries with a particular expertise in healthcare and in master patient index and health information exchange solutions. Prior to Verado, Joaquin worked at Initiate Systems and IBM. Joaquin, take it away. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. Um, we've got uh, this uh, webinar set up for an hour. I think we, we probably got about 45 minutes of material to go through. So hopefully we'll have time at the end for some questions. Um, just to run through what we're gonna cover today, um, I'll give you first a brief background of uh, who we are here at Verado. Um, we'll talk real briefly about uh, why patient matching is a problem that's uh, as you know critical as ever. Um, I think looking at the folks that are on the call, everyone knows this, but it's always good to ground the conversation in that. Um, today we're talking specifically about HIEs, so we'll talk about some of the unique characteristics of HIEs that make patient identity resolution, duplicate management, and matching uh, a, a particular authority problem for HIEs. It's a problem for everyone, but there's some unique things about HIE that we'll get into. Um, then we'll talk about um, kind of the, the current state of the art uh, with master patient index technologies and um, where they're doing things that are good, but then also where there's still big gaps to fill that we can do much better on um, by helping, helping uh, you know, advance the state of things with respect to patient matching. Um, and specifically, we'll go into this concept of referential matching um, and how it makes a, a pretty big leap uh, in results versus the traditional approaches uh, most people are familiar with. So uh, who is Verado? Um, so Verado, we, we are a, a software as a service company. We have a cloud-based platform um, that uh, basically does two things. Uh, uh, if you have an existing master patient index, um, then we turbocharge that. So there are a number of different ways that we basically help you get much more value out of your existing patient identity processes. Um, you know, often, uh, most often those being centered around uh, some type of master patient index or enterprise master patient index. Um, and then we also help clients by um, basically being the source of truth for patient identity across their enterprise um, or uh, between enterprises, as is the case in an HIE environment. Um, so we do that um, primarily in healthcare. We do some work outside of healthcare, um, but within healthcare, we work with providers, payers, health systems, ACOs, HIEs, aggregators, um, uh, every part of the market segment to help with this problem of patient identification. Um, as I mentioned today, um, we are primarily going to be talking about um, how we can slot in and basically improve existing processes that you have. Um, we'll touch a little bit about um, uh, our role as kind of the source of truth, um, but most of the conversation will be focused on this idea of how do we make your existing uh, uh, MPI processes and technologies uh, significantly better. So, uh, Verado, uh, we've, I don't, I'm not going into the full company background here. We've been around uh, since 2012. Um, in the past year or two, we've started to gain a lot of momentum, have some good um, recognition by some of the industry analysts. Uh, you can see here um, in the HIE sp space specifically, we've got a number of flagship customers that are doing some really interesting and innovative things um, with our technology. Uh, we'll get into a few health uh, specific of those case studies here uh, towards the end of the end of the session today. So uh, why is patient matching critical? Um, again, most of the folks it looks like on this call are probably well tuned to this, this, uh, this notion. Um, patient matching, duplicate detection and resolution, uh, linking records across health systems has always been um, sort of one of the, you know, the, the hidden problems um, behind information, health information exchange um, and other uh, critical healthcare business processes. Um, you know, these are just a few points that, that recently have been raised um, that, that make it clear that this is still as big and urgent problem as ever. So whether you're looking at the, the ONC targets to uh, for for specific organizations to have duplicate rates less than two percent by the end of this year, um, and you know targets to go down even below one percent several years thereafter, um, or whether you're looking at the ideas that have been talked about um, a lot for not just the last couple of years, the last couple of decades um, about having some significantly new nationwide solution to this problem, um, 
because it, it is in fact not just a, a local problem within a hospital or within a region, um, but with mobility of people um, and, and the way services are spread out um, nowadays, uh, it really is a, a, a very big, broad scope of problem. So specifically, if you look at a lot of the things that, um, that HIEs are focused on today, um, basically everything relies on having an accurate picture of the patient. Um, so whether it's kind of the nuts and bolts of exchanging clinical records, CCDs between um, different members of the care team, whether it's notifying a physician, um, primary care physician that one of their patients was uh, just discharged from the hospital and there's follow-up activity, um, if it's more um, consumer facing, so trying to enable consumers with better views of their um, of their own clinical information, helping getting them engaged in the process, um, or if it's advanced analytics, um, these are all things that that we see you know the leading HIEs and successful HIEs getting into one or more of these higher level services, um, and and all of these do depend on having that complete picture of a patient. Um, so what we see out there is as the sort of level of maturity of the services being offered by by HIEs are are going up, then the importance on having an accurate view of a patient, um, which specifically means matching the data accurately across the many participants, um, is is just becoming more important as as uh, as as the services are offering get adopted. So if we if we look at um, the patient matching idea something most people are familiar with. Uh, you've got records from two different health systems, two different providers, let's say. Um, they each have pieces of demographic information on them. Um, this convention you'll see throughout this deck will, will follow this where you've got a person and they have uh, this constellation of attributes around them, um, uh, a name and address, a date of birth in this case. And if you're trying to figure out if these two records are the same person, then typically you try to line them up and um, if you have the same values and it's Joaquin Neto and my birth date and my address, then, then I'm the same person and, and you're able to provide an integrated clinical view of myself. Um, the problem is that uh, data changes over time. So um, there are real life events that cause the demographic attributes that we use to match patient records um, to change. So obviously people move. Um, 10 to 15% of the population moves every year. Um, people have name changes. You get married and you change your name. These are all not data quality problems that organizations have with how they capture data. It's just the nature of, of how data exists in the real world, that it, it happens to be changing. Um, add to that the types of data quality issues that people are uh, quite familiar with, HIM professionals are very familiar with. Um, data capture is an imperfect process. Every registration system uh, operates a little bit differently. People have different practices, and we'll get into some of that. Um, and despite best efforts, there are always going to be errors uh, about how people have entered in information. Um, there's also ambiguities just built into the nature of data. So everyone knows that if you're looking at patient um, matching issues, um, there are some notoriously difficult problems with family members and twins and uh, you know, fathers and sons with similar names, um, certain ethnic uh, name origins um, have had unique characteristics about them um, that cause, uh, you know, cause issues when they're, they're, uh, they're entered into EMRs. And then another big problem that you see with, with data that, that makes patient matching identity resolution difficult um, is that there's good chunk, big chunks of healthcare data um, that is uh, just uh, very sparse, it's not complete. Um, so for a variety of reasons, um, medical record information um, does not have all of the information you'd like to have on it. Not every record has a name and a date of birth and a social security number and an address and a phone, right? You see lots of data um, coming through, whether you're a, again, whether you're a health system, a payer or an HIE, uh, you see data that is missing information. Um, maybe it's, uh, it's, it's lab data, and it's from an external lab or it's a, a separate lab system, and the data capture requirements for that are not as robust as they are for a particular hospital registration system, for example. Um, so you've got this other big problem of data incompleteness. And all of these things match up to 
result in um, uh, a very difficult problem when it comes to matching. So um, the way that manifests itself is you take your two records about presumably the same person and you try to line up the information you have. Um, even if the information is right or partially right, you often have this situation where the pieces of information just aren't the same. Um, so I like to use an example that, that we see with basically all of our clients where one source system, source system will have a, a name and a date of birth and a social security number for a person, which is good, reliable information to identify someone with. And another system will have um, a name, an address, and a phone number, let's say. Also pretty good information to identify someone with. Um, but those attributes just don't line up. And so you can't figure out these are the same two people and you're left with two fragmented piece, uh, pieces of clinical information um, that you're presenting to um, either analytics or a care team or, or someone and they're not benefiting from the full view of the patient. So, so going, going, taking that idea and, and then thinking about it in the context of HIE specifically, um, there are a few things that um, uh, make HIEs uh, unique. One is um, the size of data sets that you're typically working with are larger than the individual providers within a region that an HIE covers. Um, they can therefore be sort of be more, more of a diverse population of data, um, more differences across the different data sources that you have. Um, you know, an HIE is collecting data from, from multiple different types of facilities and facilities that are operated differently that use different EMR systems under the covers. Um, this all leads to this, this big, um, you know, a more diverse set of data, which means a more diverse set of data issues and data problems that you're going to encounter at an HIE level than you might encounter in a, a more closed uh, health system or hospital setting, let's say. Um, the other part of that is not just from the data perspective or the technology perspective, um, but you also have very different governance approaches to data across the different organizations. So governance is something that has had a lot of focus on it the last five years or so. Um, many organizations are looking at ways to, you know, adopt better data quality practices, um, having data governance rules that ensure they get improved data quality. And one of the goals behind that is if you have better capture of patient demographic data, then you'll be able to do a better job creating that complete view of the patient. Um, and that's good. Those are all good efforts. Uh, one of the interesting things that you see with HIEs is you may come across organizations within your HIE. One hospital has adopted certain governance practices. Another has adopted different governance practices. Even if they're both good practices, it can raise challenges with um, when it comes to matching data across those systems at the HIE level. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through an example or two of that here in a couple of minutes. The last thing is that, um, and, and most of these things are not unique to HIEs, right? So, so for the folks on the call that are, that are from, from the provider space or the payer space, you'll, you'll recognize these same problems too. Um, but, but even in the HIEs, um, you know, there's this continuous process of bringing on more providers. So, um, you know, many HIEs, those have been around, have, have onboarded uh, major hospitals in, in their geographic area, um, but they continue onboarding um, new facilities. Maybe now they're on to, to onboarding clinics, onto onboarding physician practices, other types of uh, organizations. Um, and so that constant influx, influx of new patient data sets, sometimes which may be very significant in size, um, raises additional issues with the identity reconciliation. Um, and then there's also this notion of um, increased adoption of the services. So um, a couple of slides ago, we, we talked about the types of services that HIEs are offering and, and they're offering more and more services, higher value services, um, services that are being more and more used in the care process. Um, and as that happens, um, the demand to have uh, very high levels of accuracy is, is only going up there as well. So there's a little bit of a, a deep dive into that first issue of, of the, uh, the, 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 the population characteristics of an HIE. So um, with increases in size in your data set, um, 
patient matching becomes exponentially more difficult. Um, and this, this is very evident. If you have a, um, a small facility and you have 100,000 uh, patient records, then um, um, that, that's a, a, a certain size problem to manage your duplicate population. Um, as you increase in size, you cross these barriers. Um, when you get to a million patient records, the problem becomes significantly difficult and you need new processes to deal with it. As you go from a million to five million records, um, you end up in kind of a whole new ball game with um, how you need to approach patient matching. This is both from a technology perspective, it becomes much more difficult, um, but then also from a process perspective, even just thinking about what an end user would experience if they were searching this repository um, uh, when there's a much broader data set, um, there's much more likely to be ambiguity um, and leave the user uncertain. Um, so, so this general problem just goes up very quickly once you cross some, some minimum data set size thresholds. Um, and again, of course, if you're a large payer or a large health system, you can have you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of records to deal with, uh, and you'd be familiar with this problem of, of patient size, uh, patient population size as well. Um, we talked a little bit about the idea that as the diversity of the data set is larger, you just have many more types of uh, data issues and characteristics you have to account for. Um, in HIEs, the other, the other thing that's interesting is this concentration idea. So um, you often see in an HIE that has good adoption across, the, across its providers in, in the region, you see um, that patients have many, many records. So maybe it's common within a, uh, within a health system environment for a patient to have uh, two or three records, uh, one inpatient record, uh, one ambulatory record, uh, something like that. Um, you go into an HIE that has uh, a diverse group of participants, uh, and you may very frequently see patients that are expected to have five, six, seven, eight different records from different participants there. Um, and that concentration of, of overlap of patient records again, is something that makes the, the matching problem a little bit unique. So this is this governance idea I mentioned before. Um, we, we were working with a particular client when we came across this, this specific situation, which is we had two providers within an, within an HIE, and they both had actually uh, invested significantly in data, data governance practices to improve the way they collected patient demographics during registration. Um, and again, with the specific goal of making it easier for them to be able to match the records on, on the back end. Um, and what one hospital did was they said, okay, um, we're gonna register and we're always gonna enter in the information that exists on a person's driver's license. That's very reliable, you know, it's, it's, it's gotta be right. Um, even if it's not right, if that person takes that driver's license to another one of our facilities and the uh, the admission uh, clerk there, uh, again, typed the information off the driver's license. Even if it wasn't right, it would be the same, and we would therefore be able to collapse the two patient records, um, which is very rational on its own right. Um, another hospital said, we're going to make um, sort of extra strides to make sure that when we're registering people, we ask them for their most current information. We have a process where we will, you know, validate and, and double check uh, what they tell us. Um, you know, basically encouraging them to give us the right and accurate information. And by doing that, we're going to be much more likely to have, have quality data. Um, and again, a good, you know, it was a good practice and it very much improved their ability to collect high quality data. Um, when the HIE saw these two, two sets of data, they discovered they were very different. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the case that one was wrong and one was right. It's just they had different data governance practices. And at the HIE level, they had to have a patient identity solution that could deal with that, could deal with these different, uh, different simultaneous uh, legitimate definitions of what a person's demographics look like um, uh, and, and, and resolve that. So when it comes to the onboarding idea, um, right, continuous onboarding of new providers, add new hospitals, add new clinics, maybe add labs. Uh, some HIEs are incorporating um, emergency medical uh, services. Um, as you add all of these additional constituents throughout your uh, coverage area, 
um, you just have more and more patient records to match. And we talked about how that's, uh, that's a, that becomes a difficult problem. And then there's the adoption, which I mentioned before, right? So as, as you start to use these higher value services, um, maybe you are uh, exposing a, a personal health record or some type of consumer application on top of your HIE services. And now the patient's gonna be looking at their own data and um, you better be sure that you're not missing information from, uh, you know, from one of their key, um, uh, key providers that's caring for them. So if we look at, um, step back and, and talk about um, the role of MPIs in this problem. So I think everyone knows that the master patient index concept, whether it's um, technology that, that is sort of baked into a, a, a larger uh, health IT application, or whether it's a standalone uh, enterprise master patient index solution is, is, is the technology that we use and have used for the last 20 years to resolve patient identity and in electronic medical records. Um, basically with HIEs, if we just zero in on the HIE scenario, we typically see there's two approaches today. So one is you've got a sort of end-to-end -end HIE stack, a comprehensive HIE solution um, that includes everything you need to operate an HIE. And one of the things on that list is an MPI that's, that's built into the stack. Um, the other option is you've created more of a best of breed HIE architecture. Um, you have an integration technology, you have a portal technology of some kind, um, you have then have a standalone MPI um, that you use to do the, the patient matching. So uh, if you look at kind of the matrix, the pros and cons of this, and we'll walk through all the different points, um, in both cases, there's opportunity for improvement, both on the, the accuracy side, um, and then also on the management and cost side of things. Um, so what we propose is that there's a, a significantly better way to do it. And regardless of whether you are in this option one category where you've got a end-to-end -end stack with, with an MPI that's kind of built in and, and does what it does, um, or if you have um, an EMPI that you have poured lots of energy and effort into implementing and tuning and managing, in both those situations, um, we think there's a way to make those, uh, those systems operate much better than they do today. So one of the types of problems um, that, uh, that folks still see um, uh, with the result of, of MPI technologies in their HIE stack, um, the first thing is this idea of data stewardship. And that was, this is really the title of the webinar today. That's really kind of what we're here to talk about in the end is if you have an MPI, um, most MPIs are set up such that um, when they can definitively identify a person, they do it. Records get linked together automatically. Um, but if there's no definitive answer about whether record A matches to record B, um, you get a data stewardship task. And so in a, in a hospital environment or a health system environment, these are typically the tasks that go to an HIM department. And there's an army of people that go and they spend their whole day resolving these things to make sure that um, the patient records are as accurate as they can be. Um, in an HIE, in an HIE, you're often not afforded the luxury to have uh, the number of people you would require to work these tasks. You know, one is just the model is different. HIEs don't have large HIM funded HIM departments. Um, and also the scale is bigger, going back to the discussion before. Um, the number of exceptions you're going to see in this broader, more diverse, higher population environment is going to be just much greater in volume, and it's just not financially practical to have people working all of these tasks that get uh, produced by the MPI. So, so what we see when we're working with our HIE clients is um, kind of these three different scenarios um, with respect to stewardship tasks. The so one is um, maybe they just aren't being generated. So, so maybe the MPI doesn't have this concept of manual stewardship, or if it does, um, the organization knowing that no one would work them simply doesn't have it turned on. Um, we see that occasionally. Um, more often what we see is the MPI produces these tasks, um, but there is no one to work them. And so there's just this huge backlog of work that's sitting there representing false negatives, fragmented clinical data, um, and, and no one is able to work those, even though it's 
it's it's a known problem. There just isn't the 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 money or the resources to to address it. And then lastly, um, this kind of relates to the second one, which is there is this queue there, um, and as needs allow, um, as budget cycles um, facilitate, um, periodically HIEs will go in and do some type of organized cleanup. So um, so so hire some some uh, some human resources to go in um, and make as big a dent in that backlog as you can. Um, so that that's what we see. Um, and, and that's where we see a, a big opportunity to to streamline that process. A couple other things that we noticed with with MPIs, um, again in general, but but also specifically for HIEs, is a lot of times um, not all the records that should be getting into these manual queues do get into the queues. So it can be a difficult technical problem to identify two records that that might represent the same person. And when we analyze MPI data sets, we see there's often a, a measurable chunk of uh, false negatives where the two records just didn't get into the queue because the data differences were significant enough um, because the data quality or just the changing nature of data over time, the data differences were significant enough that the MPI couldn't recognize that they might be the same people. So you have these kind of false negatives that don't even, uh, don't even raise to the attention of the data stewardship idea. And then the last thing is, last thing is that um, um, you know new duplicates are always being created right so um, this entire problem of, um, of having duplicates unlinked records um, the ideal solution even if you could be resolving all of these on the back end and, and had the money to afford stewards that could work them all it'd still be much better to get them uh, prevent them from occurring in the first place so so don't miss the opportunity to match the clinical record when it comes in the first time uh, and have to go back and do it later. In an ideal world, you would be able to just get it right the first time. Um, and so if you had access to high enough quality data and, and current enough data, uh, then you could attack this problem up front where you know, it matters most. Okay, so... Um, how does Verado specifically propose to help um, help with this situation? Um, and before I get into the how we do it and the concept of refer retro referential matching, it's sort of these three these these three steps that that we take um, when we come into a organization that has an MPI that they like that they want to keep, um, but that they just want to have better value out of. So so what those are is is the first is this idea of automatically resolving tasks. So we, part of, we have a specific um, service that you can call, and instead of having a user sit in front of a screen and decide that two records are the same person, um, you call our service and we provide that response automatically. That's, that's step number one. Um, uh, step number two is uh, simply going after this idea of, hey, how many are out? How many false negatives are out there that didn't show up in the queue? Um, that varies a lot based on the technology you have. If it's you know, a more sophisticated a standalone EMPI, um, maybe does a better job of finding these. Uh, if you have been able to invest less in the tuning and configuration of your MPI, then you might have a, a decent chunk of these false negatives sitting out there that would be worth, would be worth identifying and resolving. And we can do that. And then the last is this idea of validating the data as it comes in. If it's missing key information, if some, if some portions of the information are out of date, then can we simply improve the quality of that um, and make the data as it flows through your entire system um, much more accurate, easy to resolve by your existing processes? So, so how do we do that? Um, so we we do it using this process called referential matching. Um, so this is, you know, we think the big leap um, in in how to handle patient identity. Um, more or less, the industry has been doing it the same um, since the turn of the century <laughs> with uh, uh, MPI technology. Um, so we've got a, a, a really significantly new approach to addressing the problem. Um, and what it's centered on is um, having, basically having an answer key. So for Verado, it's um, uh, what we call Carbon, which is a, um, uh, which is a database of uh, uh, persons in the U.S., and we think it's the most comprehensive database there is for um, uh, managing 
uh, person identity. Um, like I said, we do this primarily for healthcare and managing patient data, but we also do some work with other types of uh, consumer data for organizations that need to have a complete um, picture of, of, um, of a person to deliver the services they need. Um, so we build this data out from multiple sources. Um, we keep it up to date by updating it on an ongoing basis. Incorporates data from multiple different reference data sources. Um, so uh, credit data, telecommunications data, utility data, other types of government data. We take all this data um, and we combine it into this answer key of a comprehensive list of, uh, you can think of it as a, a longitudinal person record of demographics. So we don't have clinical data in here, but we have all of the demographic data that you use to identify someone. And we have that profile of how, of, we have that profile over time, how they exist over time. So what we do is we take the data from these multiple sources. Um, we have specifically selected the sources of data that we acquire um, and uh, done that with intent to, to kind of fill in gaps. So uh, we, we use credit header data um, and there's some really good things about that. Some aspects of the data quality are really good with that, but we also know there's certain data elements and, and certain characteristics of that data that are not ideal and not as accurate as you'd like them to be. So we combine that with other data sources that we know um, will provide a better view of some of these other attributes about a person. Um, and we take all of this data, we combine it into this definition of carbon, and what we end up with is a definition of a person um, that is very rich. It, it, it has, you know, most records we have in carbon, almost all of them have all of the demographic attributes you would want to see for identification. So it's, it, it's the name, the address, the date of birth, the SSN, phone numbers. Almost every record has all of those data. And that's where it's different than the data that we see coming in from our clients, EMRs um, or the HIE technology, uh, EMRs via the HIEs, um, is that oftentimes you have only two or three or four of those data elements. Um, but inside of carbon, we have each of those persons represented and we have all of their demographic data elements on file. So the way we're able to use that, kind of going back to those illustrations before, where you might have two sets of two records with different sets of demographic data about the same person, um, and they just don't line up. So they don't look like the same person because you have one old address and one of them has an SSN and the other one doesn't, and the other one has a phone number and the other one doesn't, so they just don't quite line up. But when you compare those records to an answer key like carbon, then you say, okay, record one is carbon number 10 and record two is carbon number 10. Um, they matched on different attributes, but it's utterly clear that they're the same person. Um, and using this approach, um, you can get a huge uplift in the amount of matching you're able to do automatically. And in fact, most of the work that data stewards do to manually match ambiguous tasks, most of that work can be done automatically once you bring in this idea of the referential match, you know, with the answer key. So this is just kind of a another illustration of this idea. Um, you know, this is a simplified, simplified version, but it, it brings it to life. And we see these types of examples all the time. Hospital A has Jane Smith at 123 Main Street, born 239080. Hospital B has Jane Jones, 456 Elm Road. Four and two, three, 1980. No reason to think, based on these demographics, that these are the same person at all. Um, no matching engine would ever call this the same person. Um, but if you look at that through the lens of carbon, then all of a sudden it becomes very clear. Um, Jane Smith got married and became Jane Jones and moved at the same time. Um, and as soon as you have that carbon in the middle, um, it becomes a very easy decision. So. A lot of people think that uh, Verado, when we, we say we're going to talk about how we improve matching, that we have some new probabilistic algorithm and, you know, better phonetic rules and a better, you know, nickname, uh, <laughs> you know, assessment than anyone else. But we, we do all those things for sure. But that's, that's not the difference. The difference is this kind of approach, which is, hey, we just bring new data to the equation. And because we have this, this extensive data history in carbon, because it is comprehensive and covers the entire adult population, um, there's just entirely new logic that we can use um, that 
establishes clear and, and reliable matches. Um, so, so this this sort of illustrates that that idea in general. Okay, so so uh, for so for results, you know, so does it does that actually does this actually work? <laughs> um, we've got um, a couple case studies here. I thought I would just run through. So the first is um, San Diego Health Connect, uh, which is a um, an HIE in San Diego. Um, this this case study is actually from when we first started to engage with San Diego, which was some time ago. Um, their their patient population is actually now up and up up towards five million. Um, uh, records, um, you know, covering covering three million people, I think, at this point. Um, so San Diego has a very very good adoption in the county. Um, over 20 providers um, are are live in in the HIE and using a number of different services. Um, when we started to work with with San Diego, they had recently onboarded um, a couple of significantly sized uh, providers in the area, um, and their MPI had had linked a certain portion of those records um, automatically uh, according to its rules as, as they do. Um, and, uh, but it also generated this sort of significant manual stewardship queue. And in fact, there were almost as many records in this maybe zone um, that might be matches that a person should look at There were almost as many of those as had been automatically linked. Um, and so it was very clear to San Diego that they, they, they needed to address this, this issue or they'd have too many you know, partial records, um, you know, uh, partially complete fragmented records um, of clinical information. Um, so we came in and the first thing we did was we did this auto stewardship idea where we ran those 187,000 manual tasks through our automated process, um, through our web services, and we were able to resolve 75% of those um, as being the same person. Once we brought in that additional data, it became clear that they were the same. Um, we then did that second part of the exercise, uh, that step two I talked about before, where we said, hey, are there any things that just aren't getting into the queue? Um, and, and we found another good set of results there. So, so net, in the end, um, we basically doubled the number of links in the MPI, which was, you know, which was a huge value. Um, and we were able to do that in you know, a, matter of, um, a matter of weeks or months, um, whereas it would have taken you know, years for uh, a, a full-time staff that didn't exist to get through it. There's a lot of other interesting things about San Diego that uh, we get into. Um, we can get into in a follow-up conversation. Um, um, they had some of these governance questions that I talked about before. Um, we encountered some things like that, like that there. Um, San Diego had um, a pretty unique amongst HIEs we've worked with had a a work group. Um, uh, specifically dedicated to patient matching that existed prior to Rado being involved. Um, so they had constituents from each of their participants that were sort of heavily engaged in this idea. Um, they brought a lot of, um, you know, a lot of domain expertise to this question. And um, as we started to work with them and explain what we did and how we approached it, uh, we were actually surprised that there were a number of organizations who um, were doing something similar to what we do, but on an ad hoc individual basis. So there were there were members within participants within SDHC providers um, who had been using individual lookup services um, when they were resolving duplicate tasks within their own four walls. Um, they would go and they would manually search through a, a third party service to to find address history um, or to find a record of a name change. Um, so as soon as we got engaged with them uh, and with these folks, um, everything sort of uh, clicked that the process we were doing was was very much just an automated version of what some of their own HIM teams within the participants had been doing um, on a much smaller scale. So, so that was quite interesting. Uh, one, one, other, one other case study I thought I'd go through here um, real quick um, is HealthX. So HealthX is uh, the, the nation's largest HIE covering Manhattan and um, Healthix, uh, just due to the size, um, you know, uh, of the size of the coverage area, first off, but then also due to the level of adoption they have. Again, they have a, a very, um, you know, very large penetration and adoption of the providers uh, in their area um, that they had incredibly large volumes of patient records. 
um, very high overlap between those records. So, you know, patients with, you know, with, with records in, in tens of facilities, um, things like that, all of which make the, you know, make the, the manual resolution of this idea of tasks almost, just almost untenable. Um, they, they certainly did their best manually to do that, um, but had been looking for some way to make just a much bigger dent into the problem and kind of they knew they had to, to you know, change the game, so to speak. So, um, so we, start, we started working with Helpix. The unique thing about them is just one, the volume. So um, they, they use our web service, um, calling our web service directly. Um, and uh, for the initial phases of the implementation, they were calling us over a million times per day. Um, and as part of that, resolving 100,000 tasks per day. So those are, you know, those are big numbers. There, there are lots of um, organizations, HIE specifically, where, you know, if you resolved 100,000 tasks in a day, maybe you'd be caught up entirely. Uh, the scale that they were at was was such that they had to do that for uh, for uh, for a little bit of an extended period of time to work through this queue that they'd had. Um, but but being able to do that at such, you know, a high rate um, was was really something that was. Um, you know, provided a lot of value to them. Um, and the other thing that 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 stands out about Healthix is um, they had uh, they were very quick to implement. So, you know, part of the value proposition for Rado is not just the uplift and accuracy that we provide. You know, getting the right answer, um, but it's also in being able to do it in a true, you know, SaaS model. So you don't have to go procure hardware. You don't have to. Uh, figure out software compatibility specs. You don't have to install software, spend weeks configuring things, um, right? You you just you just call our APIs from your integration engine, um, and so they were able to be conducting real transactions within six weeks of starting the project, which uh, which was pretty exciting. So on so on that note that that sort of tees up the, the these other aspects I, I just introduced this that um, you know we we Rada we we talk a lot about how the approach is different um, the, the having carbon and doing the referential matching gets us much better accuracy but what goes hand in hand with that is it's not just getting back the better accuracy um, in the end it's also what you have to do to get there so you know the nature of how this works you know in part being being a SaaS service but in part, the fact that the results we get are really driven by having this carbon data asset um, at the center um, means that you don't have to go through all the, um, you know, jump through all the hoops and hurdles that you have to do with traditional technologies to get your MPI to fulfill its full potential. Um, so we, you know, we, we come across clients who have, um, you know, gold standard MPIs and uh, technologies that are well regarded, they're best in class or have been best in class. Um, but the, unless you have put, you know, uh, had your data science wizard in there assessing the algorithm and, um, you know, unless you have gotten things properly tuned to support the data volumes you need to support on hardware you need to support, there's just lots of reasons why you can be limited in your success, you know, with traditional technologies. Um, so having this cloud offering basically ready to go out of the box, um, not being something that you have to extensively configure, um, again, because it's really a data-driven answer that you get. Um, all of those things add up to just a, a, to a very different way um, to solve this problem that, that we're seeing as effective and particularly effective for HIEs because HIEs are, because of the model for everything we talked about today. So how do you get uh, how do you get started with Verado? Um, you know, there's there's lots of ways that we can plug into uh, different types of environments. Um, we we talked about a few different things today. Um, you know, the simple version is you have an MPI um, and you're happy with it, but you know it could you could be doing better either because you've got this um, queue of of stewardship tasks that you're you know show up on a monthly report every every month and they never go away. Um, so you know you could attack that. That's something we can do very tactically and very quickly. Um, or if you have a sort of a broader identity, uh, broader goals around improving your identity practices and, and the results you get, um, then 
uh, we've got this broader link solution where basically we provide you a a, a true universal patient identifier um, for your um, your HIE or or, or your EMRs, um, and and we do that as well. So that's um, that's what we wanted to cover today. I think I was two minutes over my 45 minute estimate, but we certainly have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, Nick, if you're out there, I don't know if we've had any come in or not today. Yeah, we've had uh, a few. Um, I've already responded to a couple individually that were uh, you know, kind of fast responses, and we, we've got a few others that are gonna require some lengthier conversations. Um, so if we don't, if I don't, Ask yours to Joaquim right now. Then, then just know that we'll we'll get out. Uh, we'll reach out to you uh, soon with with a lengthier response. But the few that I've gotten so far are: Can I use you if I'm not an HIE, and how is it? How is the solution different? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Good question. So we, you know, we focus this conversation on HIE. Um, we there are some specific, you know, integration patterns that we have for fitting into an HIE. Um, given the different types of platforms we've encountered. Um, but we can also certainly interact directly with uh, EMR software. So uh, we work with clients who have a, a single uh, EMR approach, maybe they're you know, a Cerner shop or an Epic shop, um, and we can work with them much the same we, way we work with a, uh, a, an HIE stack. Um, likewise, we encounter um, clients who are um, uh, right, healthcare systems with multiple EMRs have a dedicated MPI. The exact same technical solutions we're sort of proposing here apply there as well um, uh, for for the uh, for anyone that has an MPI. Great. Yeah, another question just came in saying uh, you mentioned several HIEs using Verado. Do you have uh, uh, other healthcare organizations using it too? But I think you covered that. Um, this one says, is your uh, stewardship service batch or real time yeah good question so our service our core service is real time so so all of the scenarios we talked about here uh, whether it's the auto steward resolving the task whether it's us assigning a universal patient identifier um, whether it's, it's us validating the data as it comes in during the registration process and you know kind of improving it as it goes into the uh, the entire data ecosystem those are all real-time uh, processes, real-time web services. They all respond in you know fractions of a second. Um, so, so that's our core technology. Of course, we do do batch work as well. So, so we will work with clients where um, you know the nature of the beast is that doing something in batch um, is what makes the integration simplest. Um, and so, so we do some of that as well. Okay, here's one. Uh, can you find overlays in an existing MPI? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we do do, we, we have something I didn't talk about today um, is we do what we call a diagnose. We have a diagnose offering where we will do an assessment of an MPI. So basically we'll take, we'll take the MPI records, um, both the kind of the raw record, the raw source records from an individual EMR, um, and then the MPI's ID as it's been assigned, and we'll basically do a, a different analysis, right? So we'll, we'll match using carbon, and then we'll identify basically the cases where uh, we found a match that the MPI didn't, and we'll find the reverse case, and those are the ones that we would flag um, as being, uh, you know, a potential issue, a potential false positive or overlay uh, scenario. Okay, we have one that says, uh, does carbon handle biometrics, um, particularly dual biometric data attributes, uh, for instance, uh, fingerprint and palm hand scanners? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So, so, so carbon itself, and, and we did, I didn't go real deep on sort of physically how, how carbon exists um, and how our, uh, you know, client, you know, how client systems directly interact with it. Um, but carbon itself, our reference data, does not have biometrics in it. So one of the things about biometrics is, um, you know, there isn't a biometric standard where uh, you have certain keys that, uh, whether it's an iris scan or a palm vein, uh, those will resolve to different, you know, um, uh, identification numbers. Um, 
likewise with the different vendors. So each biometric vendor has a different system for how they uh, store and manage the biometric IDs. So inside of Carbon, we don't have the biometric ID, but inside of our link offering, uh, when we are operating assigning universal patient IDs for you, there we have the ability to store your biometric ID. So if you have one or more biometric solutions, um, then we can basically integrate that biometric ID with the uh, you know with the with the patient record uh, with the universal ID that we assign. And in subsequent case, cases, if someone presents at another facility uses that biometric, um, then we can link directly using that biometric ID. Great. Great. Okay. Here's one that says, um, yeah, here's one that says, uh, do HIEs typically update their patient information with the information they get from your service, or are they just using it to match the duplicates they already have? Um, that's a, another good question. The, the best practice, so, so the short answer is that, you know, our match decision, are these two records, do these two records represent the same person? That's the key, uh, that's a key piece of data that our clients use. Um, now, we do something that we do uniquely is we provide basically the supporting information. So when we're able to get a match um, uh, that, that's not otherwise identifiable by the, the our, you know, our client systems, um, it, it's because we have carbon and we have the data in carbon that allows us to make the connection. Uh, so, so we understand it's important to have for audit purposes and other reasons knowledge of, of why these match decisions were made. So as part of our service, we not only provide the answer, but we do provide the supporting evidence. So we provide that evidence. It's usually used in more of an audit type capacity rather than in the capacity to, um, you know, to change data in the operational systems. Um, the only exception to that is, uh, you know, something like, like addresses. So when we find that we have a more current address on file for someone, um, then clients have the ability to, uh, you know, to store that as an alternate address. Uh, you know, something like that uh, is something that we do get into as well. Okay, here's one. Uh, does your auto steward process require an algorithm analysis or adjustment of thresholds? Yeah, another great question. So, um, it, it's nothing like the process you'd be familiar with if you've implemented um, if you've implemented an API, an MPI um, service before. So our algorithm is, is basically out of the box. It's, it's tuned to the population of the U.S. We've, you know, invested um, uh, massive amounts of our own R&D resources on tuning the algorithm for this, this data set across the country. Um, and we think that is, we think, we think we've got that right, you know, based on significant customer feedback. Now that said, there are several, um, there are there are some variations that we expect to see across clients and we do see across clients. So there are a handful of levers. Um, you know, you, you can think of a, a threshold type lever um, that gives you the flexibility you need to make some adjustments. Um, but to put it in perspective, um, when we engage with clients, we typically go through a process where they they we, we take a sample of the data, we process it. Um, business analysts within the organization um, will will look at the results. Um, and it's over the course of, you know, a couple weeks, a couple, you know, daily sessions, um, we would identify any of those, you know, three or four levers that, that they want customized, um, and, and you'd be on your way. All right, we've got a few more here. Uh, this one is, uh, how do you integrate into the registration workflow for, let's say, a Cerner shop? Yeah, great, great question. So the, one of the, one of the things we showed before, the, I, I now forget if it was step one or step three. I think it was step three. Um, is is inserting us into the front end. So as you collect data during the registration process, um, you can call Verado, um, and and we can do really two different things. One is um, if one is we can basically validate the information you have. So uh, you enter in the information for a person, we match it up against carbon. And we say, yes, you know, we found this person, we have them on file, um, but but we have a different SSN on file. So uh, you should ask, you know, confirm that that is their correct SSN. Um, in part of that same workflow, 
Um, if we have data elements on file that you haven't actually collected from the patient, you confirm that they're, uh, you're confirmed with the patient that that is their information, then you can actually put that information into your registration. So thereby, you know, bulking up, augmenting the data that you're using for that registration event. So that's the, that's kind of the demographic data portion. Um, the other piece would be if we're actually running uh, link where we're assigning universal patient ID, then we simply give you that universal patient ID as part of that process as well. And there are ways to integrate that into um, the registration workflow. You know, that, that certainly varies. That certainly varies EMR to EMR, but, but that's the concept. Um, so there's a few more questions uh, that, that have come in, but like I said, a lot of them requires uh, sort of lengthier answers and, and more in-depth conversations. So we'll be sure to reach out to, to you folks individually. Um, and another, some more questions have, have come on about uh, um, the receiving the slides and the recording. So look for an email from us uh, within the next couple of days with the webinar recording, and we'll upload the slides of the PDF and send that link out to everyone as well so you can have those handy. Um, Otherwise, yeah, we'll reach out to anyone else who, who asks questions, and, and thank you all for, for attending today's webinar, and thank you, Joaquin, for a great presentation. All right. Thanks, Vic. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for attending.